Good morning. And happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Princeton, where in our open and welcoming community, we live our message of hope, love, justice, and joy. Whether you've joined us here in Channing Hall or live on Zoom, it's wonderful to be together on this beautiful day. And we extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. We're really happy that you've joined us and we'd love to get to know more about you. If you haven't already, please stop by the newcomer table just outside those back doors in Robinson Lounge so that we can get you all the information that you need about our congregation. Again, welcome everyone to UU Princeton. We have a few announcements. The first is that all are cordially invited to the Women's Alliance year-end celebration with lunch, the annual meeting, and poetry this Thursday, May 18th from 12 to 2 in person in the Founders Room here at UU Princeton. Please bring a salad or a sandwich to share. Women's Alliance will provide the traditional May lunch dessert, which is strawberry shortcake, as well as hot and cold drinks. After lunch, we'll have the annual meeting with the approval of donations to organizations that serve women and children and election of officers. Then the Alliance will pay tribute to the late great Rice Lions by sharing some of her meaningful and moving poems organized by Ruth Ramsey. Rice was a talented poet and a longtime member of the Alliance. And then after lunch, it's a packed day. Elaine Nigam and Vicki Campbell, the Garden Keepers co-chairs, will lead a tour of our lovely Memorial Garden, weather permitting. No reservation needed, and all congregates and all guests are welcome to what's going to be a wonderful afternoon, Thursday, 12 to 2. And our second announcement is that the Racial Justice Ministries Indigenous Peoples Concern group invites you to join them at the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape powwow on Saturday, June 10th. We are organizing carpools from UU Princeton. All ages are welcome. The powwow features Native American dancing, drumming, and singing, and you can sign up by going to uuprinceton.org, clicking the Sign Up Genius tab, and then selecting this program. And now with mind and heart, may we celebrate and praise the one light that offers each sunbeam the one breath that fills each body, and the one fire that lights each spark. Come, as many and as one, let us worship together. We light our chalice in the name of love, in the spirit of love, in a vision of love. A love that is affirming of all. A love we strive to be reminded of in our times of fear and hurt a love that is powerful enough to overcome hatred and cruelty, a love beyond belief, a love that believes in us. We begin our prayer and meditation with these words from Mary Harrington. We come together in praise and thanksgiving for the gift of life itself. Some, uh, someone gave birth to us and some of us have given birth. All of us have been mothered in our time. All of us have mothered. Let our time together be one of recognition that we arrive from so many places, joy and delight, wistfulness and longing and worry, unmet needs and unfulfilled dreams. May we also hold in compassion those for which Mother's Day is painful. Those who wish to be mothers and don't have children, those who have lost mothers or spouses, grandmothers or mother figures, those who have lost their children always too soon, including by miscarriage, those who are estranged from their mother or child, those for who this day may be complicated or awkward, those with families who don't include mothers, dads, raising children or single fathers, those parents whose identities do not fall within the societal gender binary and neither Mother's Day or Father's Day connect with who they are or celebrate them. Loss and sorrow, loss and emptiness. May we hold tenderly the celebration and gratitude and the sadness and grief present within our spiritual community. And may we seek to support and care one another in our commitment to a deep and abiding love that holds us all. Closing with words again of Mary Harrington. 
There is a kind of love we cannot live without. It is never too late, no matter our age or situation. We sing a song of gratitude for all the moments of being known, being cherished, being found. Amen and blessed be. Once upon a time, after one of the battles and one of the wars, the people gathered seeking peace. Their side had been victorious, but perhaps they knew that peace is always temporary and that war would find them again and perhaps soon. And so they sought a divine source of peace, something or someone to remind them when tempted with violence that peace was an option, to remind leaders that peace was wished for by above for the beloved ones on earth. They remembered and named aloud Irene, daughter of Zeus and Temis, who was the goddess of peace. She carried a cornucopia with her, that which feeds, and a torch, that which enlightens. And at times she carried another deity in her arms, Pluto, the god of prosperity. With peace comes prosperity. In representations of her, Pluto looks like a baby, making Irene look like a mother named Peace, associated with sustenance and wisdom, carrying a child representing fruitfulness and abundance. And it was where the hearts and minds of the people turned after a battle that whispered of full spread war, a whisper that would become a full throated roar within decades. Indeed, after one of the ancient battles between Athens and Sparta, one of the many skirmishes that would precede the Peloponnesian Wars of the early 400s BC, statues to Irene were erected, joining those already sculpted so that peace might stand and gaze over the land. Altars were created in her image as places to worship and be reminded of her guidance. In some images, she was using that torch to set weapons afire, setting them ablaze so that they might not harm anyone anymore. Her presence in bronze or marble or image evoked not only the high and sacred calling of peace, but also the distance between that calling and reality, as then and now peace remains less the exception, less the norm and more the exception. More than two millennia later, Julia Ward Howe, an Episcopalian turned Unitarian, would respond to the wars of the world with similar but more fiery calls for peace. She would attempt to unite women of the world in a global push for peace, declaring that they would no longer settle for the kinds of war and carnage that destroyed their husbands and sons. The most visible part of this campaign was the creation of a Mother's Day of Peace, proclaimed in 1870. She had different dates in mind, perhaps June, perhaps later. She publicly wondered if July 4th could be rebranded as the Mother's Day of Peace, but that didn't really take. But that was the beginning of Mother's Day, not as a day that celebrates mothers, but as a day that compels women and more broadly the world to turn through activism to peace. Howe was an activist in every way, anti-slavery, peace, pro-suffrage and gender equality, even what we, what we would now call some sexuality education, all in the context of her era. She was also a successful poet who is best known more broadly today for writing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the pro-union, anti-slavery, Civil War anthem that is nonetheless sometimes mistaken and as endorsing its opposite in message. Howe was very clear about her sympathies, all of them, all the time, and Battle Hymn was written as the sacred anthem of freedom and abolition. Her idea for a Mother's Day of Peace did catch on a little, but it wasn't until Anna Jarvis, an Episcopalian in West Virginia, decided to build a liturgy around it in the early 20th century that Mother's Day became a cultural force. Jarvis had very exact ideas and principles about how the holiday should be celebrated that reflected Howe's commitment to peace, but also built in more explicit and grateful sentiments expressed toward mothers just for being mothers. One could say this expanded Howe's vision, one could say it polluted it, but all can say that it is far more profitable to celebrate mothers than it is to advocate for peace. And when the market got a hold of the holiday, Mother's Day quickly became something that Jarvis herself came to absolutely detest. By the end of her life, which turned tragic in many ways, she actually wanted to officially rescind the holiday that she had helped develop. 
It had become too commercial and the industries that profited from it repulsed her. She got so mad writing about the greeting card and the chocolate industries. I read this like two days after I sent my mom a card. So it's kind of in here. She wrote, a printed card means nothing except that you are too lazy to write to the woman who has done more for you than anyone in the world. And candy, you take a box to mother, then eat most of it yourself. A pretty sentiment. And she did not mean pretty sentiment in a good way. She meant empty and without meaningful effect. I know this is a tricky holiday for a lot of people. Some folks aren't into it. You're not as not into it as Jarvis was not into it by the end of her life. And she definitely makes me want to apologize to my mom when we talk later today for eating some of the chocolate covered cherries that I got her every year as a kid. So sorry, mom. I owe you many boxes of chocolate covered cherries as well as many, many other things in life. So we hold today this holiday that continues to whisper of peace in a time of perpetual war and also meets the desire to name as honored and sacred the roles of mothers in our lives and in the world. What exactly it means or where its emphasis lies depends on the celebrant. While we tend to look at broader observances and come to judgments about others, Mother's Day is better approached as a kind of mirror into which we can look and understand something about who we are and our lives and our commitments. And while it doesn't reflect what Howe or Jarvis wanted, that doesn't mean it doesn't reflect something valuable and important. It just means that things change. And it's difficult to imagine going back. Mother's Day is about moms and has been for a long time. Peace still whispers through it, though, and we who serve a sense of the holy Lu, who, like the goddess Irene, desires peace for all of the Earth's children, can accent the holiday with that history, which lives on as instructive, as a call, and as a gift. Peace remains a verse to be sung in the celebration of this day, even if the broader song covers other ground. And we hold this holiday that reminds us of moms no longer here, who live in memory and pictures and places and recipes and songs, and whose absence is more powerful in our lives than any cause or industry. However it was created, many are led by the tender heart of beloved memory this day. And in that soft, quiet space, sometimes a word or two of gratitude is the best way to observe. And for some, this day brings the reality of estrangement and the pain of broken relationships and misdeeds. This then might also be a day of sadness and of difficulty as the images shared are of an affection not really felt. It's in all these personal pastoral spaces that the original piece of the holiday can find a new expression, often by sitting still, breathing deeply and being with whatever is going on. Love and loss, happiness and joy, there is no way in life for a holiday like this to not elicit these and more responses from ourselves and our family members, our congregants and our neighbors. We should only expect that. And while the tendency might be to focus on what others are doing or feeling or saying, the wiser path is instead to center in and breathe and be aware of who we are and what we're feeling. The wiser path is of self-discovery and definition. It's like the story of the Buddha where he asks some monks to go to the river to get him some water to drink. They do, but they find the river is moving very quickly and churning up the bottom, and all of the water that they collect is too muddy to drink. They dump it out and go back to the Buddha and apologize and say, but there's just, there's just no drinkable water in the river right now. We'll have to try again later. But the Buddha instructs them to go back and collect water anyway. Just fill a jug and bring it to him. They do, and they settle it on the ground before the Buddha, who just remains still and just waits. And after some time, the monks can see that the silt has collected at the bottom, and most of the water is clear and drinkable and fresh and delicious. And the teaching is that the same is true with the mind. The busier it is, the murkier it gets. So if Mother's Day or any day, like Monday, is busy and confusing, either in a good way or not, Find some space to just be and observe even for a second and things will get clearer. When we are still and quiet, which were the two things my mom asked of me more often than anything else, will you be still and quiet? Clarity emerges and with clarity, some space or some healthy emptiness. 
and with space comes agency and with agency freedom and freedom in our liberal religious tradition is the greatest of gifts in our faith we were made to be free and we are made to work for everyone's freedom and the motivation for that ministry is love god's love for us and the way we reflect that love in our care for one another universal love leads to a commitment to universal freedom in our tradition and theology meaning among other things that sting was really just being a good you you when he sang if you love someone set them free sting's not really a you you at least not that i know of although i'm sure we'd take him if he wanted to join this is the freedom to not react as larger forces would have us react and instead to be exactly who we want to be in any given moment. In some artistic or therapeutic circles, this comes from a place called the pause. Eugene Gentlin popularized that term in a book from the 80s called Focusing, but it's widely taught and employed now. Just take a second to pause and notice what one is feeling to articulate a thought before reacting so that we are able to be who we want to be. I think of it as the time in which I can choose to be more human than harmful or more moral than mean. And it's from a space like this that we can celebrate more, full, more fully the love that we feel or the sadness or the more complicated emotions that come with this day. Rather than them living us, we can live them. We can love and name and remember more fully the moms in our minds and hearts this holiday. And rather than yearning for a center no longer here and never to return, we can enjoy the complicated beauty of this day. One with roots in mothers wanting peace, not war, and one with branches and buds of motherly love and gratitude. One that is undoubtedly too commercial, but one whose commerce, commerce is certainly less objectionable than plenty of other commerce popularly engaged today. One that invites us to be peaceful and loving and appreciative and understanding, celebratory and aware that some have little to celebrate on a day like this it's good that it's become complicated because we are complicated as people as families as communities as countries were textured and contradictory and interwoven in really really odd ways it's only sensible that we would observe diversely and yet still as one for none would be here without mothers of birth of the earth going back generations and generations centuries even millennia we are all of mothers and of one mother going back to greece where so long ago people responded to war by building statues of a goddess who wished for peace among her subjects they wanted war no more they wanted peace evermore and they prayed for that to happen she was to be worshipped as the bearer of that peace. The idea being that if she, like the deities of her time, were pleased in her honoring, the fruits would come to bless the people devoted to her. And so they honored her, venerated her, and built statues and altars only to find a great war coming their way and the holy ones silent in its advent. And perhaps they learned anew that peace is ours to make as we must learn anew every day. It may be a divine wish, but it's a human project. It's something we construct with holy blessing in human hearts, connected to one another and remembering the peace that is forever at the DNA of this day. Even if it isn't in the messaging, we can celebrate a spirit of both appreciation and commitment. We can be grateful and connected, blessed and blessing. We can love and honor moms and promote peace, that same timeless peace that moms in Greece must have desired when they saw conflict threaten their loved ones. The peace that you see in the eyes of a newborn taking in one who loves them like no other. The peace of the mom looking with joy upon the child dancing on stage, making a free throw, snuggling up with a dog, holding open a door for a stranger. Or it's all the same peace within, among, and beyond, the peace that leads us to love one another, to nurture one another, to throw down our weapons and study war no more, the peace that mother spirit whispers into every being, in every heart, throughout time and place, that teaches us anew that peace within, among, and beyond is possible. With love and freedom and the space and the courage, she whispers anew this day, Peace is possible and it is guaranteed when we demand it. May it be so and happy Mother's Day, amen.
extinguish our chalice, knowing, knowing that its light carries us until we gather again. Go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of love and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen.